Hello and welcome to the book launch for Martin Glynn's Reimagining Black Art and Criminology. Um, I'm Rebecca Tomlinson, Martin's Commissioning Editor at Bristol University Press, um, and I'm delighted to introduce our speakers as Martin and Mohammed Rahman. Um, so I first started talking to Martin about a book project when the BSC was held at Birmingham City. Um, it took a good few years for it to get to the proposal stage, um, but I'm just so glad that we kept in touch. Um, what struck me about Martin when we first met and what shines through in his writing um, is the passion that he has for his subject. And that's what makes this book so special. Um, it isn't simply another academic monograph. Um, it's an exploration of the relevance black artistic contributions have for understanding crime and justice. And it brings that much needed attention um, to marginalised perspectives within mainstream criminology. And there are some really important take home messages for all of us. Um, those involved in academia, publishing, and just way beyond that. Um, so Martin and Mohammed will talk for about 30 minutes, and then after that, Mohammed will be putting your questions to Martin. Uh, so please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And then if you have any technical issues, please use the chat. So questions in the Q&A, issues in the chat, and then if we can keep it that way, we'll make sure we don't miss anything. Um, so details of how to order the book, the paperback um, at a 50% discount will be available in the chat too, and a recording of the webinar will be available afterwards. So um, I'm now going to hand you over to the speakers. Thank you. Rebecca, thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for logging in, especially on a Friday afternoon. My name is Dr. Mohamed Rahman. I am a senior lecturer in criminology at BCU. Martin Glynn's uh, colleague also as well, and I'm delighted to be part of this event. Um, for several reasons, I've known Martin for several years now. Um, we're very close colleagues. Uh, we tend to have quite a lot of intellectual conversations um, on the phone, even though they start out quite informal, uh, they end up becoming quite serious. And when I got my, uh, my copy of the book uh, several weeks ago, um, I was reading um, some of the stuff that we've spoken about for several years, and it's quite refreshing to see some of the informal conversations that we've had in cafes, on the phone, at work, before lectures start, um, ad hoc meetings. Um, some of the stuff that Martin has discussed over the years is now on print. And it's, for me, been quite a bit of an education um, because I was able to relate associate some of the conversations that we've had over the years um, when reading some, some of the chapters. Um, so it's quite refreshing and it's been an education for me. And I've um, managed to read the book twice actually. So I have some questions, um, but it will be interesting also to hear from the audience. So if you do have any questions, please do uh, pop them into the chat function and there will be ample time hopefully for all questions to be answered. Um, Dr. Martin Glynn is a lecturer in criminology at BCU. He's an author. This is actually his third book. Uh, his first one being Black Men, uh, Crime and Invisibility, uh, which was published by Routledge. Uh, his second one was also published by Routledge, Data Verbalization. And this is his third book, which has been published by Bristol University Press. As well as being a lecturer, uh, Martin is a uh, researcher, a writer in residence, for a National Justice Museum in Nottingham, and also an individual who is quite creative into the arts, and who has an extensive um, practitioner's experience within the criminal justice system. So I'll, we'll make a start and um, bring in Dr. Martin Glynn into the conversation. So Dr. Glynn, how are you, sir? You know something, it's, it's an emotional feeling right now. Um, it, when I hear what Rebecca said, what you're saying, knowing that people are tuning in and I can't see them. So for me, what, it's actually one of the best feelings in the world to be able to take what's been in my head for probably 40 years and put it into a book and to have the, the, the benefit of knowing that there's something that's going to be in the world for eternity. I mean, at a time when the world's in crisis and everything's going up and down, I have to celebrate the fact, not just my achievement, because the book was never, it, the content was mine, but it's been a team effort. I mean, all the staff, 
in there, all my friends, all the people I put in the, the, the introduction, people like yourself, because writing these type of books is not easy, especially when you decide to write a book in your own voice. So to me, today is a cause for celebration for all of us who were told we'd never be able to make it, we'd never be able to do stuff. So for me, I, I'm, I'm just very humbled that I'm at that stage in my life when I'm still achieving and doing stuff when at times people write you off. So I'm doing okay. What about yourself? I mean, you're looking very different to when we see each other at university. So, I mean. Well, um, I'm actually happy to be part of this event. Um, you know, uh, grudgingly, you've got the attention today. <laughs> I'm turning back a favour for you hosting my book launch uh, a few years ago. So we'll kick things off, if anything. And I think the most appropriate question to ask you or to ask any author is um, what's inspired you to uh, write this book? I mean, why now? Well, I stepped on stage for the first time ever when I was about six years of age, Nottingham Theatre Royal. I was about six and I was in the Boys Brigade and I, I was that was my first time on stage, which means that over 50 odd years, I've been involved in arts and creativity, public speaking, um, when I engaged, when I started working in criminal justice, one of the things, as, as I established myself as a poet and a playwright, I did, I'd established myself with that. But when I started working in prisons, I used to go into prisons and bring theatre, music, different types of arts. And I, the prisons always used to see it as, oh, you're just entertaining them. And I realized that that's was, uh, that wasn't what I was doing. I was using art to reconstruct people's sense of self who'd been either forgotten, nobody cared about, because I was working with particularly high-risk offenders. And I did it for about 15, 20 years, uh, relentlessly, never really got paid, just constantly going into the prisons. And then there was a period when I worked in a maximum security prison called Long Lawton. And for the first time, the prison recognized behavioral shifts in the offenders. They were very long-term offenders. And I didn't really understand what was going on. I really didn't. And so from those early days in the late 80s and 90s, I was part of two movements, the National Black Prison Support Project that I used to be part of. I'm working in these prisons. And the moment I discovered that I could impact, I met I was at a conference, a theatre conference, a prison theatre conference, I met a professor who's now Professor James Thompson, who I'd got this reputation for working with black offenders. And between him and another woman called Anne Pika, they both asked me to write respective chapters around working with black offenders. And I, I, I just never thought nothing of it. I just thought, this is what I've done. But then out of it suddenly became the philosophy that actually not only does art transform, but for marginalized groups, which my offenders, were, I was working with black offenders, what I realized is there was something here. And then from the 90s till now, it was a 20, you know, it's a 30, 40 year journey to basically understand what is it intrinsically about art? What is it about the engagement? What is it about that enables a, a, an offender to desist? So what happened is I, I'd had this in my head for years and years. But when I used to speak to people, they told me I was mad. Because I said, you know something, I think the arts works better than sociology and criminology and say, are you mad? So I said, no. So initially, when I put the idea together, it was because I'd done a second book and I just said, you know, I want to write a third book. And then what suddenly struck me that in academic terms, if you're going to write a third book, you have to write the book where you want to say something. My other two books was to prove that I could write. This one had to sit alongside everybody else's. And, and what, what started to happen is two books in particular, which is the Sociological Imagination, C. Wright Mills, and the Criminological Imagination, Jock Young. I read them both and I realized they didn't include me in their work. And that's why I realized that, and it's not their fault because they were writers at their time, and I realized that rather than me write kind of an anti-book, I wanted to look at black art within the context of the criminological imagination mm. using 
the essence of these two heavyweights, but rolled into my lens. And I started it, I wrote the proposal. The initial response was, it's okay, Martin, but you need to do some work on it. And then what happened to George Floyd? And then what I realized is with George Floyd, the first thing I remember with George Floyd is the video footage, which was film. Then I saw graffiti, which was visual art. And then I listened to the funeral, which was hip hop artist and gospel artist. And I suddenly said, this is it. And then I started to look at all the stuff I'd done in the arts and reading black crime fiction. And the, what I realized is, is that the community I'd come from had already documented the lived reality. And all I wanted to do is to pay tribute to that in a book but also to say to criminology as a discipline, you can no longer ignore marginalized perspectives when you're saying that you want to be all inclusive. So in a long winded way, that's the journey from 40 odd years ago to prisons um, through to the National Black Prison Support Project and all the support I've had along the way. But to write the book, that for me, gave me the biggest challenge because when I first wrote the proposal, I thought nobody's going to take this seriously. I mean, you did and a few people, but I thought it was going to hide into nothing. I really did. So that's how it came to fruition. It's interesting that you mentioned um, the arts and the academic side of things that quite inspired you because you felt as though somewhat what was written by C. White Mills, uh, the sociological imagination and the criminological imagination written by Jack Young didn't necessarily um, take into consideration and accommodate some of the stuff that you've been part of or that you've experienced over the years as a black man or even just as an academic. And this brings me to my second question, which is the title of the book, which is extremely captivating, especially for those that know the work of Mills and Young. Uh, you, the, 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 the title is We Imagining Black Art and Criminology, but it's the subtitle that kind of got to me, which is a new criminological imagination. And what you do is you mention at the back of the book that it's time to disrupt current criminological discourses, which still exclude the perspectives of black scholars. Can you just elaborate on that a bit and just offer some context? Especially yeah, I, I, yeah. I mean, I think the first thing is, I like the idea of an imagination because Imagination has no bounds. I know that in my study of criminology and sociology, that everybody had defined my reality from slavery, colonialism, through to the civil rights movement. When I was growing up, I was taught that black people didn't write books. We didn't have a point of view. And I, it's not that I was critical of it, but I, I just didn't understand why is it that me and other people that's gone before, people didn't really take note of it. Having worked in prisons for four decades, I used to I used to remember I go to a prisoner and a guy, men, the mainly men that I worked with, would be looking out of the bars and the windows, and they'd be imagining being free. And I realized that I felt symbolically confined and incarcerated by a discipline that actually excluded my experiences. Now I realized I had an imagination, but because criminology as a discipline existed, I needed to reimagine my role in it. Not imagine, because I already knew that I'm in it. But in the reimagination, what I realized is part of my own healing was not to knock. It's not like when you do a literature review and you criticize previous scholars. I can't criticize in that way. It's, it's just not proper. But what I started to look at is, is when I look at black arts, when I look at the development of hip hop from the early days in the 70s to now, it's seen as more sophisticated. What I wanted to recognize in reimagining is to go back and reflect on all of those people that have contributed to that reimagination. Because, you know, as you know, Mo, as, as academics, we like to think we're authentic and nobody's done what we've done. We've contributed to knowledge. What I suddenly realize is, is that's not true. From slave narratives to the jazz, to the blues, to reggae, to visual artists. So reimagining, I felt as a term, is for any marginalized groups. It's for any group who says, I want to look at this differently. I don't want to discount what other people have done. 
I just want to look at this through my lens. In the way, there's a famous African-American author called Toni Morrison, and she was asked, why don't you put white people in your work? And her response was, I don't need to. I just want to imagine a world of what it's like the way black people live when they're in the black community. It's not they're excluding people. And I wanted to, in, the, in that moment, for anybody that's into whether they're into LGBT, whether they're a Muslim, whether they're working class, whoever they are, to reimagine, to be able to think again, but not get caught up in just attacking what's gone before. Because without what's gone before, I wouldn't be able to, because I'm going to be one of those what's gone before. So the reimagination, and it's something I get from my mom. You know, my mom used to have this great saying. She used to say one day, she says, one day you'll grow up. One day you'll be a great person. So she always taught me to reimagine what life would be like the moment I go through various stages. And that's basically, and the interesting thing about the new, because in reimagining and writing the book, it becomes a new criminological imagination because everybody's got an imagination so if i write two if there was two and a half billion books written and they all put the word imagination because everybody's imagination is authentic i didn't want to come across as the author as the the definitive voice of the black community i wanted to say i just want to reimagine what the world would be like if i was included and in including me alongside all the other heavyweights, the family expands. There's just a, a, a different family member in the room. Whereas before, I always felt when I walked into rooms, it was like, you know, you walked in and you kind of, you know when you know you're the only black person in the room, because everybody looks at you as if to say, he's the, he's the odd one out. I don't want to be the odd one out anymore. I want to sit in the room with everybody else and say, look, read my book now, then read C. Wright Mills, and then, and then let's have an argument about what everybody else has done, but I can actually stay like Rosa Parks. I decided I want to sit at the front seat of the bus. And nobody, nobody put a gun to my head and said, sit at the front seat of the bus. I said, no, today I'm going to do it. And I also, and this is really important, I also wanted it to be a tipping point for young people from my background who said it's not possible who said it's not possible to reimagine that you can go from being poor to affluent, to going from marginalized to gifted and talented. So within the title, there's a lot of meanings that the book covers to justify using that term. Interesting, you mentioned um, how you wanted to bring to light some of the individuals that have influenced you, not only just in the academic world, but also um, through lived experience. And we'll come back to that later on because that's pretty much the main body, the spine of your work, which is your interactions and your dealings with individuals from a very young age. Um, but in the opening chapter of your book, you mentioned how back in 2018, you um, participated in a symposium, which uh, took place in London and it consisted of several international scholars who were talking about black criminology, its relevance, its need. And that for you was pretty much a um, springboard uh, to kind of affirm, uh, reaffirm, and take some of your ideas forward, which you've now put in print. Can you just elaborate on that? Because one of the things that you said was that that symposium um, inspired you um, but it's important to, I guess, let the individuals know the nature and extent of that. Well, I mean, what happened is, is that I started reading up on indigenous criminology. I mean, criminology now, there's so many different types of criminology. And over the years, um, there was a range of people that were inspirational for me. Catherine Russell Brown, who was the, the first person to coin the firm the term uh, black criminology in 1993, Sean Gabidon, um, there was indigenous scholars. And so I also started looking at post-colonial criminology. I, I just started to look at the contribution of other scholars from around the world. And I remember an article by Ben Bolin and Coretta Phillips about the need for minority perspectives. And I always have a, I've always had a problem with that word being a minority because the vast majority in the world 
people look like me. Black and brown people are the, in the majority in the world, but when it comes to academic framing, we're seen as minority. So when we went, there was a conference at the London School of Economics, and I, I'm not gonna lie, I, it's a bit like if you went to Hollywood and you saw Robert De Niro and Al Pacino, and you go, oh my God, and you don't realize that you know, you're working opposite Samuel L. Jackson in the same movie, that kind of thing. I walked into this room and I saw, I mean, everybody that I've admired was in that room. I mean, if, if we'd got kidnapped on that day, then the whole of the, all the senior people would have just disappeared. I saw Catherine, and now we've been corresponding for years, and Sean, and it's the first time I'd met them. And uh, everybody came up and, you know, they talked about Stuart Hall and gangs and, you know, it was it was quite traditional, but there was an argument about there's a body of knowledge and work, past and present and the future. Anyway, Catherine Russell Brown came up to the podium and it was a podium. And she started off and she delivered this thing called the art of black criminology. And what she did she from a lawyer's perspective she looked at everything from critical race theory and she what she was saying is that in the african-american context the narrative that defines black life the story there's an absence of stories but those stories are contained in hip-hop and theater and all this other stuff so what she did she read this thing and you could see in the audience there was a kind of stunned silence it wasn't for me. I was like, a, a sight, little child. I was like, yo, yes, that, yes. <laughs> anyway, I was there to perform my speech using my method, data verbalization. Anyway, so I got up and I performed my conference speech using hip hop. And once again, it was like, is this guy for real? Anyway, I, I joined the break as you do. You know what it's like and join the break academia. Everybody breaks off. And, you know, but I went to Catherine and I said, Catherine, We've been corresponding for about 20 odd years. I said, you was the most influential person arguing this from time. And I just said to her, I said, you know what I'm gonna do? Because I know you're a lawyer, you know, you're the chair of the American Society of Criminology. I mean, she's big. But I said, I promise you, I'm gonna write the book. And I said, I said, I'm gonna write the book that I want to write. I'm not gonna, it's not about an African-American book. It's not about that. But I said, well, I will promise you, that by the time I've finished, that criminology will sit up and listen. And I said, what will happen is white academics who are into rock music and classical music and theater are gonna take note. And I said, right wing uh, critics of race are gonna say, you know something, I'm, I'm gonna write a play or I'm gonna do a series of short stories because I can't get my research out there. And I said, another thing is I'm gonna demonstrate that peer reviewed journals, important as they are, have disconnected themselves from the source material of people like me, which is the community. And I said, not only am I gonna pledge that. And I went back to Birmingham and I remember sitting there thinking, well, what am I gonna do? Because at the time I didn't have a proposal. And then Bristol University Press came to BCU and I heard them speak and I thought, you know something, I don't know, there was just something about the people in the room and I, I put this proposal together and I said, you know something? Yeah. And then I also remember when I sat down in the quietness of my own headspace, I was thinking about my mom. My mom passed away many years ago, but I always remember me going to my mom and saying, mom, I want to be somebody. And she says, you are somebody. And I remember what she said. And so any fear that I had about doing this book, I knew that it was going to be different. And so with Catherine, Catherine sent me an email the other day and she just said, Martin, she just said, thanks. The book's beautiful. So right now, from the African-Americans, all, all sorts of people. But for me, what it rekindled in me is the academic with purpose. You know, I've never been, I, you know, I'm not one of those people that sees myself as um, wanted to make a name in academia. I want to change something in society through ideas and intellectual ideas. And for me, that's where that passion came from. And I remember when the book came out, I've had a lot of those people who were at that conference come back to me and actually say, Martin, well done. A lot of people didn't think I'd do it. A lot of people didn't think I'd do it because they said, how, how are you going to justify bringing black arts 
and the criminological imagination together. And that's where George, as I started writing it, George Floyd crystallized it because symbolically, it's the arts that brought George Floyd. It was not academics, it was the arts. And in tribute to him and all the legions gone before. And I also wanted to say, my brethren Richard, the countless people I've worked with in prison who sing, the people that read and couldn't read and write that wrote a poem for the first time, they had a lived experience of criminality or as victims. And I wanted to say, you know something, they listen to music, plays and theatre. And I realised that what C. Wright Mills and Jock Young were talking about is to, the both of them talked about revolutionising. You know, I remember Jock Young, one of Jock Young's things, he, 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 he was always saying that, you know, criminology needs to get out. And C. Wright Mills was saying it needs to get out, tell stories and engage. And I thought, you know something? Yeah, I mean, I'm in good company. I'm in good company there. And that's how it came about. What I find interesting is um, in your formative years of your work, and even now, there's been quite a few women that have motivated and inspired your work. You've mentioned your mom, you've mentioned Catherine Russell Brown. And in your book, you mention a friend of yours who in the 80s, while you were working in Boston, USA, said to you, for you to um, do a large body of work in prisons. <laughs> Apparently that's where everyone was at at that time. And you decided to return back to the UK and you started um, to work with offenders during the eighties in some of the most high security prisons in the UK. Um, and you took an arts-based approach. Um, but what's interesting for those that don't know, back in the 80s, the notion of a rehabilitation was pretty much redundant. You know, we had a right realist approach uh, to crime and punishment. So tough on crime, tough on punishment. We had a conservative government. But yet there's you who's working in prisons with offenders, <laughs> high-risk individuals, and taking a rehabilitative approach. And for me, it seems as though that your work was way ahead of its time because now we're finally having these conversations about arts-based uh, therapy and uh, reoffending and strength-based approaches and so on and so forth. But you thought about this about 30 years ago. I mean, Wait. how hard was it for you to do that kind Yo, of work? Yo, Bridget, I, I was performing. I was a spoken word artist. I was at Covent Garden and I'm performing in the open air. And uh, there's this little short black woman with an Afro. And every time I'm performing, She's just looking at me. So I'm thinking this is a stalker. You know what I mean? I thought she's going to give me the uh, the Norman Bates treatment. I just thought, I thought I'd done something. She come up to me. She, she's American. She just said to me, hi, my name's Linda Thurston. I live in Boston. Uh, I live in the same community that Malcolm X was born. She just ran this past me. And she said, do you want to come to Boston? So I said, yeah. I mean, I didn't think about it. I went to Boston and I had the most amazing experience. Very scary experience, but the most amazing experience. And before I left, she gave me... A, a an album that she gave to her dead father, a, a dead father gave to her by a guy called Jimmy Smith. And she gave me four addresses, prisoners addresses. And she goes, if you really want to address the problem, she was actually an, an activist in America. She never told me until I got there. And I got four uh, emails of black prisoners, African-Americans. I selected after about a two year wait, I took one, start to write to him. He was a very famous prisoner. He was one of what's called the Angola Four. There was originally it was the Angola Three in Louisiana, but he was the fourth. And I picked this, this prisoner who was in prison with a guy called George Jackson the night he was executed. George Jackson wrote a book called Solidad Brothers, very famous, Angela Davis, and all of this kind of stuff. Anyway, what happened is I took, I started to write to this prisoner called Nayati. And he goes, Martin, you need to go into jails and you need to sort the men out. Now you imagine I'm like 10 stone and I'm being told to go into maximum security business and sort the men out. And I thought, well, what can I do? I, the only thing I can do is do poetry and spit bars and I couldn't do nothing else. So when I first went in, I wanted mixed groups. I wanted mixed groups. I said, yo, give me white, black. I, it was like that attitude. Give me white, black, green. I sound like a rap artist right now, black, white, green. Give me anybody. And said, no, you can't work with white prisoners. I said, what do you mean? This is too dangerous. 
and they, the prisons that they, because they, these guys are here because they hate black people and they're this i said no i don't care anyway what happened is with the with the support of people and pika and the the theater and prisons and probation project in manchester and my friend diane they brought me into spaces where i could try i could try stuff out now the thing about it is when the prison regimes saw behavioral shifts, when they saw men in their cells reading and writing, when they saw men sharing and performing, they wanted to understand how did you do it? Now, my initial response was, is well, we share the same cultural heritage. It was like that. Until I start working with white prisoners. So when we had mixed groups, it wasn't like it is now. I mean, you walk in there, you got like five Tommy Robinsons in a group with two or three Umar Johnsons and you know you've got all of these dangerous men but all they want is to be able to express themselves so I had to use my technique as a theatre director to keep order in the room I then had to provide each prisoner with what you would now call um, co-produced work so it was never group work everybody brought their own experiences and what tended to happen is Men didn't want to be in their cells. So the trade off was if this activity is beneficial for you, then you need to be compliant with making sure it's a safe space. Word got round so many prisons that for a period of years, I was just inundated with, with prisons. But I, you know, and I get this from my mom. I, I'm not going to lie. My mom never gave up on me, never, ever gave up on me. So I never gave up on a prisoner. You could be as racist as you like. You could have murdered three people. So for me, it wasn't that I was clever. I wasn't bringing in contraband. It was never about that. It was just that my level of compassion, my commitment, my energy, I refused to give up on the worst of the worst. I've been called the N-word more times than I can shake a stick at. I've had people give me death threats in a prison. But the moment I use storytelling, I overcome it, they welcome you back because what they realize is they want to say, are you up for this? Are you tough enough? Can you handle this? So in some respects, I can't credit. I can I say what I did, but my mom is the one that says, find the light in the darkness. Find something in anybody that you work with that is special. And because I never gave up and I've been in some dangerous situations, that's what got me through. And the residue was you got great poems and a play and a concert. But what I got from it is an understanding of masculinity, an understanding of self-concept, um, what makes people human. And being able to drive that through the arts means that you can appeal to the artist in the criminologist and the criminologist in the artist. And so that's how that came about. Thanks for sharing that. Um, we're going to come back to some of the points that you've made. I've got several more questions, um, which are going to be uh, quick fire questions um, before we um, open up the floor to our guests. So if you right. have any questions, please do pop them in the Q&A function. We're also on Twitter as well. So please follow the relevant handles and the hashtags as well if you want to post anything. Um, one, the favorite chapter in my in the book was uh, the chapter which you um, discussed black fiction. Yep. And one of the things that you mentioned is that black fiction, uh, in contrast to its counterpart, is more nuanced because it has to take into consideration blackness uh, and the context that blackness is situated within culture, society, and so on and so forth. And the interesting thing that you mentioned was that black fiction in many ways has an academic grounding to it, similar to what's known as ethnography, which is the study and observation of people in society. And the interesting thing that you do, which you've done throughout the whole book, because it's quite autobiographical and accessible, is that you've, um, in, in the chapter Shadow People, you've put some excerpts of ethnography, ethnographers, Elijah Anderson, talking about his experiences while doing some academic research. But then what you've done at the same time is contrasted it with fictitious work. And the point that you make is that you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between either or. And that for me was quite profound because I never thought about ethnography that way, even though I've done some 
targeting myself with organized criminals. Can you just briefly touch upon the relevance of blackness when it comes to writing, whether it's academic or black fiction for that matter? Yeah, for me, you know, when you're writing about the black community, the community is a space, it's a physical space, it's a cultural experience. And what I suddenly realized is a lot of white academics would, they want to research race and they want to learn, research black people, they want to want to do this stuff. And I said, you first have to understand the community, you, you need to understand dumpling shops, you need to understand the nuances of black life. Yeah. And black fiction writers, when they started writing in certainly in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, they couldn't get access to publishing and they weren't sociologists and and, and so what it is, they were like researchers. They write what they saw. They write what they knew about. And they captured it, but they just did it with fictitious characters. But the world in which they captured was that's the way it was. And I was reading something about slavery the other day, and, and this slave is describing being on a slave ship. That's an insider perspective about slavery. Yet we've seen historians who describe slavery from an outsider's view. And I don't have a problem with that. But the thing is, what I loved about the chapter is to say that if you can't go into the black community, study black crime fiction, because you'll get an insight into the world, the language, the culture. But what I'm also saying is that ethnography shouldn't lay an authentic claim that it represents the world in which it's writing about because you're a researcher. Novelists do it, hip hop artists do it, playwrights do it, short story writers, visual artists. And therefore, the artist chronicles life in any community you and i both know if i was researching working class white men as i've done one of the first places i'm going is to a pub but if i decided to write a play i'm going to try and capture that world so that working class people when they come to see the play are going to say yeah yeah that's the way it is so what i realize is is ethnography means to write about people a novel is to write about people poetry is to write about people but when we look at research and we look at the research and excellence framework, then what we do, we start to stratify structurally what constitutes research from what doesn't. Well, from my point of view, as a critical researcher, I'm interested in the role of research that changes something. So does our insight into that world enable us to access it, work with it and change something? So therefore the novelist we all have a role to play, not just the researcher. And what I've loved about that chapter and demonstrated, that it's very hard to distinguish between the two. So my question to criminology is, if you're only saying that ethnography is done by these people, so Charles Dickens, Shakespeare, Jane Austen, so therefore the whole of creativity is predicated on it reflects a world that we relate to in a fictitious context, but it's a world we relate to. So therefore, as a researcher, I don't want to say I'm an ethnographer to the exclusion of other forms of expression that describe that world. And that for me, if you look at fairy tales, when you've got a child, you paint this beautiful world that doesn't exist, but to a child, it does exist. So I look at it, a good ethnography tells a very good story, the universality of suffering and pain with an attention to detail. And that's what novelists and playwrights in all cultures do. All I did, is represent the bit that was excluded from my perspective, which is black writers, but every novelist. I've learned as much from Charles Dickens and Shakespeare as I have with all the other writers. Fantastic. Um, I'll have to um, restrict my questions because we're running out of time and we've got some questions that are popping up as well uh, in the chat function. You have a chapter um, which is titled Staging the, Staging the Truth and it's um, again, an autobiographical account of your time working in theatre, and you mentioned some of the stuff that we know already, which is that theatre is underrepresented, uh, misrepresented in many ways, and one of the things that um, artists like yourself, writers, uh, screenwriters find difficult is actually surfacing the, um, the truth. And that's because of something that's known as silences. And you mentioned in your first book, um, Black Men, Invisibility and Crime, 
about interrogating silences when confronting individuals that come from marginalized backgrounds, um, deprived backgrounds. But then you also, also apply the notion of silences to theater work. And I just wanted to know why is interrogating silences or the concept of silences, if you could just elaborate on that first. Yeah, because well, first and foremost, the silences is about the unspoken, the unsaid. In a stop and search situation, it's not the act that happens, it's the subtext, it's what's not said, it's what's not seen. And for me, everything is said in the silence. When you give a person a life sentence, there's a, there's a silence before their, le their knees buckle. And I think that for black people in particular, or marginalized groups as well, who are silenced and muted, everything takes place in the subtext. And if you look at the notion of trauma, trauma takes away your voice. So if you've had historical trauma, if you've been traumatized by the criminal justice system, you've been traumatized by your actions, what happens is everything takes place below the surface. And one thing that art does, it brings the silence to the surface. Therapy, it gets what's in the subconscious, brings it to the surface. So for me, silence is important, but silence is used in relationship to power, the police. You've got a right to remain silent. In the community, the code of silence, the veil of silence. There's other types of silence, which is meditation, reflection, but you choose to do that. But society imposes silence. In the court of law, if you speak, you can incriminate yourself. But in America, you can plead silence. You can, t you can go to the Fifth Amendment and say, no in, in an interview, no comment. So silence for marginalized groups is where a lot of marginalized groups experience pain in the unspoken, in the unsaid. And what I wanted to do is uncover that and say that when you impose racism or oppressive practices, you make people silent. And you'll find in communities that I serve, they're silent because they're traumatized. And then when it recoils like a spring, as we've seen with Black Lives Matter or the Me Too campaign, what do you start to see? The silence has come to the surface. And what do we do? The criminal justice system kicks in and pathologizes and wants to incarcerate it. Then, then people go quiet again. So for me, I know the most dangerous people I've ever worked with are the quietest. Some of the most clever people I've worked with in prison are the observers. So therefore I also, you know that term silent but deadly. Yeah. So, so for me, I'm just saying to people like jazz, if you look at two notes, it's what takes place in between those two notes. And silence, even though you say it's the absence of sound, it's, but it's not the absence of feeling. It's not the absence of emotion. And I'm saying what I'm interested in is to explore the silence through the emotional response, through the, the way that people feel, not just what they do. Because I'm, I'm getting a bit tired about being judged or people get judged purely based on their action. I'm also interested in action. How we feel, how we process, how we understand things is silent. It's not action that you see. And so, so for me, silence is, is critical on every level for me in the way that we understand oppression. Well, Dr. Glynn, um, it's been an education. Dr. Glynn, I, is that what you call him now? That's not what you call me normally, brethren. So, you know, you the, audience, the audience consists of our colleagues <laughs> and senior management. So I have to. Um, All right, then. So I'll, I'll take that back. Call um, me Dr. Glynn then. <laughs> Martin, it's been it's been a pleasure. I mean, one of the things I said to you a few days ago was that the book, in many ways, is not you reinventing the wheel because that's what a lot of academics like to do. Just like politicians put their mark on something, whether or not it makes us makes no sense, makes sense or whatever, is another story. But what you've done, you've pretty much um, offered a conversation starter, and I look forward to scholars citing, developing, amplifying your work within the context of their own in the future. So thank you very much. And um, yes, yes, yes. Oh, here it is. Um, yes, yes, there, yes. So we've got we've got a few questions. Uh, we've got a few comments. So I'll I'll take lead on this, if that's OK, with Rebecca and Co. Yeah, because um, I'm, I'm not good technically. So yeah, it's pointless. So I'll, I'll, I'll read it out. Right. Um, I think your friend Eli Anderson uh says greetings brother martin a real honor hearing your works and have ordered your book the purposeful academic doing the work to heal our souls no question just a sense of pride stay blessed Hold well out, respect eli. to eli me and eli go back 40 years eli's a storyteller extraordinaire we go back a long way and 
you notice the arts has brought us back together on this particular medium. So, you know, respect due to Eli, because he's still out there doing it like me. You know Brilliant. I mean? We're we've part of the family. We've got an anonymous attendee uh, who's asked you, what do you think the future of criminology is and will be a positive space for those young people from a non-traditional background who want to get into academia? I would say this, um, you know, you're, you're looking at someone who's worked with people who were called non-traditional. I don't like the word non or traditional. Uh, it, it's for me, it's a commitment to change and to find purpose and vocation. And I started out life with nothing. So I would say to people, if you really want to know how to do this stuff, read Malcolm X because Malcolm X went to jail. Read the works of Gandhi, Martin Luther King. Read the works of anybody in your local community that's done extraordinary things. And the one thing they all have in common, they're driven by purpose. So I would say it's not about non-traditional, or non-conformist. Wake up in the morning and say, like Rosa Parks, I'm going to sit on the front seat of the bus. You can say to yourself, you know something? I know there are mans there that have been bad, but I relate to them. I'm going to keep their stories alive of raising their kids. So from my perspective is, it's not non-traditional. We're, in, we're all in this for a specific reason. So I would say, and where people like me come in is just the mechanism of how I've done it. And then you draw your own conclusions. But when anybody thinks that you can't come from a poor background, be black, be 60 plus, it's not true. It's just that what we've got to do is not just put everybody on Channel 4 and BBC2. We've got to communicate. We've got to get on. Buy the book. Send me an email. Let's talk via Zoom. So as Mo said, we've got to keep the conversation going. So, you know, being on your own ain't your best friend. Remember this African saying, I am because we are, we are because I am. I'm here because of all of you lot. And you lot are here to talk to me. So at the end of the day, Bridget, when you get a chance to get my email address, holler at me because there's a lot of people on this journey. And my job now is to pass on what I know and to enable the next generation to do it their way. So there's no such thing as non-traditional. There's just new things. Like I said, reimagine yourself and say, yo, I want to do it differently now. I was answering that. Um, Shioma Lee Crayfon has asked you, what advice would you give to a uh, to other mixed race people wanting to write an autoethnographic style for a general audience? How do you manage to strike a balance between academic writing and your own personal experience whilst keeping it engaging? Well, you know, Summer, I'm going to be honest, it's maybe controversial, but I've just got I've got brethren of mine who, if I kind of stepped out of line, they're just going to give me a slap on the back of my head. I mean, I've never disconnected from community. I know where I come from. So therefore, if you've disconnected through experience, you have to reconnect. Because I can tell you this, you know, when I pass away, it will be the community that will bury me. It's not going to be a group of academics. That's not how it works. So for me, it's about knowing where you come from. It's about self-belief. I've had to fight for recognition on both sides or anybody that I work with. So at the end of the day, life is about struggle. And I don't mean struggle in a sense of in a war zone struggle, but life is ups, downs, it's turbulent. And all again, I go back to whether it's me, whether it's Mo, it's, it has to be intergenerational, multi-generational. It's recognizing that hip hop is as important as Shakespeare. It's recognizing that my book is as important as Jay Z's lyrics. It's recognizing that Mo's work about organized crime and coming from a Bangladeshi background is something that I need to read. So make yourself a citizen of the world. Go to every part of the world. Go and sit in an old people's home. Go and sit on a park bench. Observe life. But if you disconnect from life and languish in the ivory tower, I, I come up with a saying, the, the, the ebony tower. And the ebony tower is full of loud music, rice and peas, dancing. I mean, me and Mo, when we're together, one of the things that's special about us, we kind of talk for a bit, but we know how to talk to each other about us two men, about our lives. So in some respects, it's about courage, self-determination. And again, it's about reminding yourself, why are you here? If you're doing PhDs and, st and stuff because it's about your ego, that, that's fine. That's never been that for me. My thing is about what difference can I make? And one example would be 25 years ago, I met a guy 
who I worked with in prison. And he'd waited 20 odd years to give me a book back that I gave him and he was free. And he credited me in enabling to stay free. So what I'm saying is find vocation, find purpose. Again, holler at people like me, just have a general conversation of support. Because that's what I did with Lord of the Rings, The Matrix, you know, great mythic tales. So I'm saying, get in touch. Thanks for that, Martin. Another anonymous attendee um, has asked you, was there ever a prisoner you worked with whom you thought could have been an artist had they not had a jail term? Every one of them, because you were artists before you got jail. Jail just meant you just teeth. You did something, you might have got angry. Most of the most creative people I know have been jail. Charles Dickens went to jail. I, in fact, most a lot of people I know have been to jail who were prominent individuals. Shakespeare wasn't exactly like when he started right. So at the end of the day, you can't look at an offender as if, well, they're an offender, they ain't got no brain. Trust me, if you ever go to jail, they know more about life and they're, they're much shrewder than you are. So at the end of the day, yeah, you've got to find some light in the darkness. Yeah, I meet some horrible people, seriously horrible people, but they might make me laugh. They might be able to draw. They might be able to doodle. Um, I, I know when I'm working in jail, you know, I always have the baddest guy in the room. Baddest. He's my right-hand person. He's got the most respect. So I find when I'm in a jail, if I've got a man who can handle and he runs the things, what I teach him, though, is he doesn't have to punch people in the face or stab them. What he does is learn leadership and gets authority by me giving him a second chance to demonstrate other transferable skills. Because one thing about criminality, it's about transferable skills. And therefore, never pathologize and judge people who are less fortunate than you. They're less fortunate for reasons that are understandable and explainable, but that doesn't demean how powerful they can be. There's a lot of um, attendees thanking you. Um, just really don't understand why. But anyway, uh, we have a few more questions. Um, and I just want you to answer them as quickly as possible because there are quite a lot. Uh, we'll start off from the bottom and work our way up. Got Shalina who uh, has asked, when is the right time to write a book? Do you wish you wrote one sooner? You know something, I'm writing all the time. When's the right time to write a book? The moment you come off this theme, you need to be writing a book because, you know, as a writer, you write. Imagine Gordon Ramsay saying, when's the best time to cook? No, he's running a business. He, you know, he, he loves his cooking. And I would say that for most people who have busy lives, you have to look at how you order the way that you approach writing. But if you feel there's a book inside of you, write it. And if you come from a background like me, where you were told you'll never write a book, so you have to confront that and then write the book. And I would say, just write the damn book or write the book. I don't want to put the word damn in front of it. Naomi Don, uh, Donald has thanked you, uh, as well as another panelist whose name I can't see. Um, Andres has mentioned, um, that you're always adding so much value to conversations. Thanks for your comment, Andres. Diane has now left the chat, but also thanked you um, and mentioned how you've come a long way uh, from all those years ago when you met each other. Uh, Rebecca is thanking you for bridging the gap between Black reality, the arts, academia, and criminology. Um, someone's thanked us for the discount, which is always nice. Um, someone's mentioned so powerful thank you as someone challenging uh, Muslim youth, I realize art may be the most powerful means of creating change. Shout out to that person. It's a shame we can't see their name. Tara has mentioned that silence is the actively present in the experiences of young people who are incarcerated and engaged in criminality. Congratulations on your publication. Uh, we have a few more questions. I've got one more question as well uh, to wrap things up. But one question for you, if you could just answer it as quick as possible. How do you think the Black Lives Matter movement has influenced Black art over the years? I mean, in the book you mentioned all the, the movements. Well, the thing is with Black Lives Matter, one of the expressions of any movement is art. It was the civil rights movement, the negritude movement in the 30s. It's always been that way. And I think, you know, Black Lives Matter uses creative as its platform. The most important thing is, though, is to recognize that the arts is as integral to struggle for change 
as the struggle itself. When people think about Black Lives Matter, they just think of people protesting on the streets, pulling statues down. But actually, when you finish protesting, you're going to go and listen to jazz and reggae and music. So therefore, music has a very clear function in revolutionary struggles. So I would say that, you know, arts is integral. It's the glue that binds all struggle, all struggle, whether it's the struggle of Napoleon, the Cuban Revolution, the French Revolution. Art was all over that, like nobody's business. So you can't separate it. If you separate it out, then your struggle will collapse. Okay, thanks for that, Martin. Um... Maxine, Liz, and Richard have given you a shout out as well. Uh, penultimate question, and I'll wrap things up with mine. Yep. Um, Andreas Harriet uh, has asked you, I deliver services within a prison setting and drawing links between artists or songs that they have been influenced by since childhood is always important in helping them to restory their past. How did music shape your childhood? From, our, from when I was born, I grew up on classical music. I drifted into jazz, followed sound system. Um, I was fortunate I grew up in a house with music. Simple as that. My mom was from Wales, so she would sing. Uh, my stepfather was into classical music and encouraged me to explore music. And at school, I was mad about music. And as I got older, it's never left me. And I would say that you need to be the ambassador for change. So you can't be expecting people to sing and make music and stand and watch them. So I would say that everybody needs to immerse themselves in what they want other people to immerse themselves in. And so for me, music, it, put it this way, if they made music illegal, like they have in certain parts of the world, then I'm going to break the law. As simple as that, because music conveys the spirit Music contains my soul. Music contains instruction. Music contains how I feel about myself. Music contains falling in love. And more importantly, music is a call to arms. So when I'm ready to go out there and face certain things, music actually enables me to prepare myself to go into that zone. Thank you for that, Martin. Dion's giving you a big shout out. Um, long may your work be creative, impactful, and thought provoking. Indeed, Dion, as an individual who is uh, able to relate to some of your struggles, but not all. I guess reading your book has been an education for me. It's been an eye opener, it's been inspiring. It's, I guess, uh, also a tool and a resource that can be applied to education and pedagogy. But my final question, just to close uh, this conversation, is what does the future hold for Dr. Martin Glynn in terms of work? It's quite simple. Um, I've done three books and like a stool, a, a stool only needs three legs. And I've made my contribution in three different areas in race and crime, uh, research methods. And this one is cultural studies meets criminology, so to speak. Um, um, the relevance of it is now my I'm coming to 64 this year. And it now means that I've created a body of work. I've made a contribution to the discipline. My soul a purpose now, a new purpose, is to work with publishers and colleagues and anybody that wants to seek change. I want to help publishers do stuff more like this and work with publishers, not against them. I want to get more young scholars who want to get published, published. I want to get more young people incentivized about writing and reading. Um, and outside of that, um, which I've mentioned really, which over the last 12 years, my wife, because I can tell you this now, that she's been at every, every back-breaking moment through it's this. Hard to with you. Yeah, I, I mean, I've been a, a nightmare. I, I feel more like Ozzy Osbourne and what his wife must feel like. But what I will say is, is that there's life to get on with as well. And I feel that by having a refined purpose, which is to help others, I'm going back to what I started with when I was working in jails, working with people's needs. All I'm doing now, my needs are virtually satisfied. I now want to be of service to the wider community, but expand it. So I want to work with publishers. I want to work with students. I, I want to work with anybody that's saying I want change so that my story is what my mum said is, one, I'm never going to give up on you the way my mum never gave up on me. Two, there's people like yourself who people don't know this, but when I was having a difficult time in work, you, my brethren, Richard, Dion, there was a, a range of you that said, Martin, and when I fell over, you picked me back up. Yeah, 
you pick me back up. And then the third one is, for me, what's really important. And I have to say a special tribute to Rebecca and her team. I mean, I've been published twice by Routledge and I don't wanna, it's not for me to talk about Routledge here. But what I will say is when I gave my proposal to Rebecca, she never wavered. She didn't understand everything, but she never wavered. She never judged it. And I remember one of the words she used that defined it. She said, you book slightly eccentric. And I felt happy. But the team that's been behind me, so I don't want anybody on here thinking that when you see my book, it was me. It was a team. It was from Rebecca saying, I see something. The blind reviewers who said, Martin, this can be fantastic if you do something. From Catherine Russell Brown and Shad Maruna, who endorsed it. People like yourself who, when, I th when I'm struggling, my department, I mean, I have to say I'm blessed that everybody at BCU in criminology has been 100% behind me. Even my critics are behind me because they can see. And, it, it, and it's something that, finish off on this. I didn't realize this until you pointed it out. I remember I was whinging about something massively. And you said to me, and I was saying, how come is it I've never had recognition? How come, you know, I was going on like that. And you said, uncle, you're producing your best work now. And what I realized is something my mom said, the race is not for the swift, but for those who can endure. And I said, if you want to still be here in the age of 64, understand it's an endurance race. So you can't just be a sprinter in academia. You can't. It's taken me three books to get to this place and 40 years of experience and struggle and hardship. And I've got there. And I feel like Edmund Hillary, when he must have stood on that mountain with Sherpa Tenzing and actually put that flag. And I can actually say that my father, who was in the 1958 race riots, August 1958 in Nottingham, and my mum, who put up with the most horrendous racist abuse from 1955 to 58, if those two people were still alive today, they would have seen their son make history. And I think people forget, and I'm not saying it to big myself up, I'm saying I've made history. I've made history because in my community, I'm one of the few that's made it through. I'm still connected to the streets. I still love my rice and peas. I still love my hip hop. But the one thing I do love is to be able to leave a legacy for people to pick up and argue with. And it's a privilege for people to either rip a page out of a book and say, I can't stand what he's written because the vast majority of people who look like me, their stories are not being heard. And so, I want everybody's authentic voice to be heard. And what I've done is created a book that will give people tools, insights, all sorts of stuff to begin that journey. So what am I going to do? I would say some of that's down to some of you lot watching because I don't want to sit here and twiddle my thumbs. I want to be useful. So if you need some, holler at me. And I'm just eternally grateful um, for the people that I've met along my way. And that's why I said, finally, Mo, there's a saying in the community, I hear it overused, it takes a whole village to raise a child. Well, this 64-year-old coming up in July has been raised by the biggest village in the world. From offenders, every type of person has raised me. So therefore, the victory on the book is not mine. I'm a living example of what the community can do to make me be where I am today. So finally, I like the prodigal son. I think I've come home. And that's why I dedicated the opening line to the book to my mom, because she was the one that told me that I would be like this. I never believed it. Imagine at six, you're going to be great, son. Come on, mom, I'm six. You know what I mean? You're going to be a great person. I'm six. But now I have to say that that woman and her sacrifices as a white woman in the 50s, put it this way. Compared to what she went through, my struggle has been with a small s. Mm. So if it wasn't for other people's sacrifice, I wouldn't be here. So basically, that's me, and I'm happy. So I want to thank you for the interview, Bridging. No, uh, thank you. Um, you know, that's very touching as well. Um, to give a shout out to the people, we tend to forget the individuals when we produce something. And um, I, I agree with you in the sense that individuals like uh, Rebecca and her team at Bristol University Press, the people behind the scenes, the ones that you don't see, the ones that are pretty much the backbone of the production side of, stage of uh, writing uh, deserve all the plaudits. 
uh, because they are the individuals that kind of facilitate this and without them it is impossible even if you do have the best of ideas so thank you very much Rebecca and your team at Bristol University Press um, you're getting more shout outs uh, and, and thanks from individuals uh, Silhouette has mentioned something alongside uh, Angela um, so many other individuals I'm uh, apologetic I'd like to say sorry to those that I haven't been able to mention uh, I don't think I think we've covered all the questions so we should be okay Pam's just also said thanks as well and just thank do you, you want to do you want to let Rebecca just say goodbye to everybody yeah, Rebecca absolutely. do you want to Rebecca over to you thank you um yeah thank you both it's been such a fantastic event I think everyone agrees so interesting really illuminating and moving um yeah it's just been wonderful so thank you both of you um, so really quickly, um, details of how to order the book um, at 50% discount are still in the chat and any future webinars or launches can be found on our website. So thank you all for coming. It's been wonderful. Thank you very much.